1995, a police officer, Deputy Sheriff William Hardy, was shot and killed while off duty working as a security guard at a hotel in Birmingham, Alabama. Police were determined to crack this case, apparently at any cost. They arrested five men in connection to the murder. The 19, in 1998, they wound up convicting this man, DeForest Johnson. He was sentenced to death, and he's been on death row for more than 20 years. But he says he did not do it, that he did not commit this crime. And he's been outspoken about his innocence for all these years while sitting on death row. Now, more than 20 years later, some of the former judges, prosecutors, and the jurors who convicted him are agreeing with him. They also say he did not do it, or at least he deserves another chance to defend himself. The story of how this happened shows a multi-engine failure in our criminal justice system, one that we have seen too many times before. In, Minis in Mississippi, with Curtis Flowers and Sabrina Smith and so many others across the 27 states with the death penalty on the books. Here's what happened in Alabama in the case of Teforis Johnson. First, when the police arrested five men suspected of, sh of shooting the off-duty police officer in 1995, Ballistics showed that only one gun was used in the shooting, so they could not have all pulled the trigger. The police decided to let three of the five men they arrested go, but they kept to Forrest Johnson and one other suspect, a man named Ardrigus Ford, and charged them both for the same murder. Now, that happened despite the fact that both men had alibi witnesses who could testify to the fact that they were at a nightclub on the other side of Birmingham when the shooting happened. Still, both men were charged and tried separately. The prosecution didn't try to argue that the men committed the crime together. They couldn't decide which of the men did it, so they tried two different theories of the case in two separate trials, claiming that they had proof beyond a reasonable doubt that, I don't know, both of them did it? Either of them did it, one of them did it, they didn't know. So they let the ju juries decide. That happened based on the word of one unreliable witness, 15-year-old Yolanda Chambers. According to the Washington Post, even the prosecutors in this case have admitted that since the 1995 murder, Chambers, quote, had told more than 300 lies about who was involved and what she knew. That is the person who was the primary witness in the case against Tofaris Johnson's friend, and she's the one who named Johnson as the man who pulled the trigger. She came forward as a potential witness only after the governor's office announced a $10,000 reward for anyone who gave information leading to an arrest. Her mother told police she had information about the murder, but she did not. But at that point, she was in a position of either providing information or doing jail time for lying about it. She later reported feeling pressured to give some kind of information. Before one of Teforest Johnson's criminal trials, Chambers even admitted that she had lied. She said she had done so because of that pressure. Quote, they was yelling at me, you know. Don't you know you can go to jail for this? And that's all I was thinking. That's all I had put in my mind, jail. I don't wanna go. So after they was putting all the pressure on me, I went on and said I was there. Maybe if I go on and say I was there, maybe all the threats and everything will end, end quote. Ford's lawyer said, quote, Chambers' accusations should have been painfully and obviously false. But apparently they were not. Both men went to trial for capital murder. Just ahead of Ford's trial, the state tried to offer him immunity if he would say that Teforest Johnson was the one who murdered the officer. He refused. He told his attorney, quote, I see where they won't charge me if I say he did it. If that were the truth, I would say it in a heartbeat. But I am not lying for anybody, including the cops. Adragus Ford's trial ended in a hung jury, and that favored acquittal. Johnson's trial went on, and that story of the witness who told 300 lies wasn't even the worst of it. Johnson was eventually sentenced to death after a laughably poor case. As a former chief justice of the state Supreme Court put it in an op-ed, quote, there was no physical evidence, no eyewitness testimony, no police confession. The state's case relied entirely on a woman who said she overheard a three-way jail phone call in which a man who referred to himself as Toe Forrest admitted to the crime. The woman had never met Mr. Johnson and she didn't know his voice. 
but her testimony was enough for the jury to convict. Turns out the woman was paid $5,000 for her testimony after the trial, a fact which was never disclosed to Mr. Johnson or his lawyers. In fact, his lawyers did not find out until 2003 and did not have proof until 2019 when the state turned over this, a copy of the check and a form signed by the judge authorizing the payment of $5,000. Johnson's legal representation worked against him as well. According to the Washington Post, Johnson's attorney, who admitted in a court filing that he lacked the necessary experience for a capital case, the lawyer wrote, defendant's attorney does not have the expertise in criminal investigation work to investigate the facts and interview the witnesses surrounding the alleged crime with which the defendant is charged. Defendant's attorney has no formal training in criminal investigation, nor do they have the capabilities and time to interview all the potential witnesses and conduct all the investigation necessary and essential to provide the defendant with an adequate defense. End quote. No experience, no training. No time to investigate. A trifecta of trial disaster. When the court later agreed to give him a private investigator, they only provided funds for someone, well, someone no one would want. Johnson's current lawyers described this P.I. as, quote, a brain-damaged, alcoholic, racist, suicidal, homeless man who had already been fired from at least one capital case for incompetence, had been operating without a business lease license for at least five years, and could barely manage his own day-to-day -day affairs, end quote. Perfect guy for the job. Now that all this information about this botched case has come to light, numerous people want justice for to Forrest. That aforementioned former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, he's come out against the case. He asks, quote, why is Teforest Johnson still on Alabama's death row? Over time, the state's case has fallen apart, and there's now substantial evidence that Mr. Johnson is innocent. The district attorney in Birmingham, the lead prosecutor for Mr. Johnson's 1998 case, support a new trial. The former Alabama attorney general has also come out against Johnson's conviction in an op-ed for The Washington Post, where he writes, as long as a lifelong defender of the death penalty, I do not lightly say what follows. An innocent man is trapped on Alabama's death row. Three jurors who voted to convict Johnson have also called for the Jefferson County Circuit Court to throw out Johnson's conviction. They publicly expressed disappointment in the trial. One said, quote, when you look back at all the stuff the jury did not know, I feel like we were used like pawns in a chess game, not even knowing we were being used. It's all very disturbing to read all of this now. Johnson's defense now has 10 witnesses who put him in a different part of town at the time of the murder. And yet justice isn't any closer. This week, the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals rejected Johnson's claim that prosecutors committed misconduct. And so the court upheld his conviction. Despite that setback, Johnson still stands a chance at an entirely new trial, but Alabama's governor and attorney general could easily end this all right now. The governor could pardon Johnson. The attorney general could drop the case, but so far they have not. Why? What's the holdup? 